Can you hear me, guys? Yeah. Nice to have you here. Uh, this is Luca Giaroli. I'm an Italian engineer, 50 years old, working in this industry, the live, uh, the live or pro audio industry, since uh, 35 years. I was 15 years old. I was the front man of my rock band, and you can imagine I went through all the, you know, the, the typical, you know, experience that, uh, you know, the, the majority of us uh, had, you know, and then all of a sudden I, I understood that my passion was much more behind the scene rather than on stage, and then, and then the university, and then engineering, and then working with several manufacturers, and then uh, as a rental company owner, and then uh, as, a, as, a, as a, and then now I'm here. I work for a lot of companies around the world. I've been in charge of uh, important designs. I had the pleasure to work with uh, uh, companies uh, dealing with uh, Olympic games, uh, uh, big events, uh, broadcast, the live, uh, biggest tour around the world. So I put together a kind of uh, a very wide experience in uh, signal distribution and collection. This is more or less my speciality, let's say. A um, few years ago, I started a cooperation with a company, uh, Direct Out, in Germany, which I also became a shareholder last year of the company. And uh, um, I personally designed uh, a, des a device, which uh, nowadays representing a kind of a cutting-edge technology in terms of redundant aspects. And uh, last year, I've been uh, uh, appointed by the Italian television, Rai Television, which was the host broadcaster for the Eurovision Song Contest, because the year before the Italian band Maneskin won the, 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 the contest. And you know that the rule of the Eurovision Song Contest is that the delegation, the country which is winning one edition will host the next edition. Unfortunately, this year is not gonna happen because last year the Ukraine band, uh, you know, delegation won, but for no reason, unfortunately, Ukraine is not able to host the, the show, and therefore the second position, which was uh, England and UK, is hosting the new uh, edition of Eurovision Song Contest. And uh, since uh, uh, when uh, uh, talking about uh, uh, what kind of seminar you can offer this year, because I did uh, something similar two years ago, three years ago, before COVID, I said, well, probably an, an interesting topic could be talking about redundancy. Redundancy is a, a very strange animal. Uh, what is redundancy? How can you define? How can you say I have a redundant system? Well, if you have a spare wheel in your trunk, you can say I have a spare wheel. But what if the engine is failing? <laughs> the spare wheel is not really helping you, right? So there are so many aspects and the more complex is the entire amount of equipment that you have to connect, the, the more is getting complicated really to say I have a redundant system. So during my university career, I've always been very keen on those aspects and I came up with a, a final dissertation called the level of redundancy as a system to design live audio environment. So I always had this idea in mind and that's the reason why I'm called Mr. Redundancy, so people call me Mr. Redundancy, right? I do not know if they do it, you know, just because they want to trigger some bad emotions or put emotion, but it is. So I'm known around the world as Mr. Redundancy because I always work in that direction. I hate PowerPoint presentation keynotes, so the only one that you will see is this one, which is the, <laughs> the title. And then we will get through several schematics and we will have a chat about a uh, few things, but before getting to the schematics, I think that we better agree on some uh, terms and some condition to understand and to really give a dimension of what is a redundant plan. So first of all, uh, when I'm uh, in charge of designing something, I need to know who's going to pay me, not because I'm worried about the money, but because I have a responsibility towards the guy who's giving me the responsibility, right? So I have to agree with him, which are the level, which are the boundaries of my responsibilities. Am I the one designing the connection of the live section of the event, or I'm in charge of the whole thing, such as for the Eurovision Song Contest, I had the whole responsibility from the single microphone all the way to the broadcast feed, including monitoring and front of house, right? 
Well, that is the range of the responsibility, the boundaries of the responsibility. As a designer, it's the first question that you have to ask the committee or the, whoever is paying you. Where, where my responsibility starts, where my responsibility stops. And then, despite the fact that you might think that the smaller is the responsibility, the better it is, well, it's not, it's not really that case when you are responsible for redundancy, because it's much easier to have the whole picture in front of you and really decide the redundant plan, rather than having responsibility of a portion, because inevitably there are connections between the portion and the rest. So it's extremely difficult to understand where the problems happen, when the disaster happens, who's faulty. I was not faulty because I designed that. Yeah, but so in the end, most of the time, the organization which is really paying for the entire show and also paying you, they, don't do, they do not know the technical details. They only know that everything went in the right direction, we didn't have any problem, or we had a failure, and we had a significant disruptions of the service. And this is all about. So we need to agree with the guy which is giving you the responsibility and therefore the money to design something, and you have to define at the first stage which is the significant disruption of the service. So what you consider something which is unacceptable, and therefore you have to come up with the redundant plan. Example, you are recording for the Deutsche Grammophon. You sign a contract that if you lose one sample, it's like not having done the recording. Who? You might have a problem. There's not going to be any redundant plan I know which is reacting less than one sample. Pretty much impossible. So if that happens, I fear that you have to start over again the recording if you don't have the possibility to lose a single sample. Is a single sample lost a significant disruption of the service in a contest like Eurovision Song Contest? Nobody is even hearing that a sample is lost. If the reaction time, if your redundant plan kicks in automatically within one sample, you are absolutely safe. Even more than one sample. And then you have to enter in much more details saying, are all the tasks having the same importance? Are all the tasks important as anything else? Or there are tasks which are much more important than other tasks. Again, Luca, you have to tell me what you mean with the task. Well, that's another point that we have, to, we have to discuss about. So when I took the responsibility of the design of Eurovision Song Contest, just to mention the last one I did, but I did Olympic Games, I did inauguration of World Cup, uh, Euro European Championships and stuff like that, you have to analyze which are the tasks, and then you have to give a rate to the redundancy level that you have in that particular task. Example of Eurovision Song Contest. One task is the audio diffusion inside of the arena. Let's call it front of house, just to you know, make it simple. So one task is front of house. What do you mean with one task of front of house? Okay, I lose completely the console in front of house. The complete arena is, no, is having no sound. Well, then you have a problem, right? But if among 32 different clusters, you lose one cluster, okay, that's not good. But one cluster out of 32, hey, I can live with that. I might not have to have a redundant plan if I just lose one uh, cluster. Okay, that is acceptable. But it's important to be agreed with uh, the organization. Because I can design a redundant cluster, but it's going to cost you the double of the double of the double. Is that okay? So it's absolutely acceptable to lose one cluster out of 32. So that level of redundancy is not required but it's un unacceptable to lose the complete front of house console and not having a redundant plan, because at that point, the ent entire arena will be without sound. Okay? So, if you really want to have a redundant plan, you need to understand that there's going to be a very detailed analysis and an agreement about what should have a redundant plan, what is absolutely agreed that won't have a redundant plan. So, if that cluster is over, and you lose one cluster out of 32, you cannot complain, oh, your redundant plan didn't work. No, that was agreed. That was not covered. But we can't survive without one cluster out of 32, right? 
So another task is the in-ear monitor thing for the, for the Eurovision Song Contest. And despite the fact that Eurovision Song Contest might be looking like any other show, probably the in-ear monitor is the most important task in that contest because it's actually a contest. So if the delegation, if the artist on the stage is not hearing properly on the, on the, on the, on the in-ear monitor, by the regulation of the contest, he can stop the show and say, hey, I'm not hearing fine. I have the right to start over again because I was not having the best condition to compete. Even if you are designing the U2 tour, Bonovox will not stop the show because the in-ear monitor is not working. I don't want to say that it's less important or more important, but Bonovox, in this case, is the one selling you the ticket. So if he's having a problem in an ear monitor, he's trying to keep going on anyway, and not stopping the show. Then, of course, the, maybe the sound engineer would be in trouble, but that's a different story, right? So in every project, you have different tasks and different importance of the several tasks. So in ear monitoring is the far the most important task in a project like Eurovision Song Contest, at least as important as the broadcast feed, which is reaching 200 million of watchers, of people looking live at the show. When you have 200 million people wa watching the show, well, then the responsibility is big. For me, 200, 000, 200 million people, piece of cake. I did the Olympic Games in Beijing, five billion people under my responsibility. So I already vaccinated. I have three shots of vaccine against that responsibility. But I was 36 years old when I was in Beijing. And I can tell you that when you are there in the control room and you know that your mice click decision is you know, changing the <laughs> experience of five billion people, well, your, your finger is starting to tremble a little bit, I tell you, right? And that's the reason why you better have a redundant plan. So that is not an option. When you are in charge of the Olympic Games, in, in inauguration, five billion people, you better have a redundant plan, and a solid one, and a tested one. And unless you want to, you know, die because of a stroke or a heart attack or something like that. So, um, what about the, uh, the, the near monitor thing? So, you, you might think, okay, then it's easy. To have a redundant plan, just put two of everything. Yeah, it's a good start, but not enough. Because you say, okay, I have, well, first of all, the microphone that is in the hand of the, the, the singer, well, at that point, you need to understand that the microphone, okay, diversity, all the other things, but it will always happen, or it can always happen that the microphone is stopped working. But A, unless you want to have the, the, the singer having two microphones, which is not really a, a good idea, or probably it's a good idea from the technical point of view, but it's not gonna work from the artistical point of view, you have to accept that worst case scenario, on the go, you need to have another microphone which is passed along. Worst case scenario, during the Eurovision Song Contest, if that would have happened, the Eurovision Song Contest jury would have the possibility to decide if it is something that can be solved within five minutes, they start it over again immediately. If it's something that would require more time, they will simply put that exhibition to the last position and then they keep going on with the next one and then they will recover that exhibition at the end of the show, right? So the microphone is not a problem. But from the microphone receiver of the RF receiver towards the monitor console, towards the front of house console, towards the musical mix you know, broadcast console, then from the musical mix broadcast console to the OB van, which is grabbing video, audio, and every, putting everything together and broadcasting live all over the world, that is your responsibility to have a redundant plan. And when, when I designed the, 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 the last edition, I had to connect something like approximately 3,000 different products of 300 different brands into three main tasks, broadcast, uh, monitor and front of house. And you can imagine that I was not in charge of intercom, but I had to exchange signal with the intercom system. Riedel was in charge of intercom. By definition, they are the only one which are present every year with the Eurovision Song Contest. They are not even going through the tender. It's an agreement that they have with Eurovision, uh, uh, the EBU. 
So although I didn't have the responsibility of the intercom, you still have the responsibility to define which is the interface, the signal exchange back and forth the intercom system, right? For example, but I didn't take care about any plan of redundancy of the intercom. But I did have the responsibility among all the others to distribute a very important audio signal, which is the linear time code or LTC or SIMPTI, whatever you want to call. Why? Because that kind of show is all based on time code. So when the playback guy pressed the space bar and the computer, all the playback tracks are playing, and you know that in an Eurovision Song Contest, is everything is playback but the voices, which are live, strictly, right? The LTC, the linear time code, which is deciding what is the time now, is synchronizing everything, video, fountains, pyros, uh, even the camera on air are decided by QPilot, which is based on uh, you know, the time code. So among all the other signals, the most important one that cannot fail is the LTC, because it's driving the entire roller coaster, right? So then you have to pay attention, and even if it's behind your responsibility, I had to inform Riddle, which was in charge to receive the LTC from me and distributing to all the other you know, subjects around the, the, the installation, then I said, guys, you have a bottleneck in, in redundancy there. What do you mean? Well, if this and this happen, we fucked. Oop, we are streaming live. Oh, you sh I shouldn't say that. <laughs> but it gives you the idea. I said, hmm, you're right. So they, they laid down other things. So if, if you are sick of redundancy, like, like I am, you can see bottlenecks all over the places, even if it's not, not your responsibility, right? But I learned an important lesson among all my international experience. Those kind of activities, either we will win all or we all lose. It's not important if it's your responsibility or not. Who remembers the Sochi uh, Olympic or Winter Olympic Games uh, uh, open inauguration? Everybody remembers that when the circles, you know, part of the logo of, uh, you know, of the Olympic Games, the five circles, the fourth one didn't light up. That's the only thing that people remember about that ceremony. See? So you don't have the possibility to have a failure in those occasions. A tour, an international tour, Rammstein, Coldplay, our devices are in tour with Rammstein, Coldplay, uh, uh, Imagine Dragons, Christina Aguilera, and all the others, they are important, they are keen on redundancy. But no matter what, it's never the same level of stress. The reaction time during a tour, you have five minutes. If something goes really, really wrong, five minutes, okay. And then you start it over. During a live show like the Olympic Games uh, you know, inauguration uh, ceremony, or, or a live con uh, a Eurovision Song Contest, you don't have three seconds. Three seconds is a complete disaster, right? You cannot afford to react that. And then I want to introduce another important concept. You might have a redundant plan, but the significant disruption of the service is something which must be kept as the polar star, the GPS, which is the reaction time I can come up with with another solution. I had to design something which could react within three milliseconds. That was the maximum amount of time. This is what I had to agree with the EBU. If you want me to reduce that amount of money, uh, sorry, the other way around, that amount of reaction time, you might spend 10 times the money just to save one millisecond. Because? Because you have to come up with a completely different plan different machinery, different connection between the several machinery. There's one thing which was very clear since the beginning. The human reaction time was out of scope, out of the picture. Nobody can react within three milliseconds. Even if you have one guy which is paid to stay there and say, ready with your fingers? If something like that happens, stroke the button. It's going to be longer than three milliseconds. So no way. So I had to design something 
which was reacting of any combination of different failure along the system within three milliseconds. Re-establishing not a disaster recovery situation, which means that among 2,000 channels, you save the 10 ones which are important. No, I had to come up with an idea to re-establish the entire number of channels, no degradation of the software, uh, of the service within three milliseconds. Well, then it's extremely complicated. I have to admit that you really need to have a lot of experience and, and this is another important point, the type of devices that you can deploy in order to do that, well, there are not that many devices on the market that can allow you to have such a reaction time in automatic mode, not dependent on a software, because there's another point of failure. It's all about having point of failure. So you might think, okay, for the playback tracks, which are one of the po most important sources, you know, among the others, among the radio microphones, which are the ones used by the several singers, you have the playback tracks. There's no real other music. So the playback track is of a paramount importance. You might think, well, when you have two times Pro Tools or whatever is the platform that you want to use for for the DAW, for the, the, the playback of, of the tracks. When you have two Pro Tools, you're safe. Yes, but who's deciding which one of the two Pro Tools is really going live? So you have a device which is detecting in, in real time if Pro Tools number one is okay or if he has a, a failure and within one sample is reacting. There are a bunch of devices available on the market about that. And you say, okay, fine, that problem is over. Wait, wait a second. What if the device that you use to have the redundancy is the one really failing? So you use the device to increase the level of redundancy, and then, as a paradox, that device is the one who stopped everything. So if that device which is doing that is failing, no matter how many Pro Tools you have, because nothing will get through. Who? Then I'm in trouble. You see, two of everything is not enough. You need to have at least two of everything beside the microphones. And then you need to have a redundant plan, which is re-patching all the existing audio signals among the piece of the uh, you know, distribution still alive. You need to have redundancy and re automatic repatching system from the origin towards the destination. And then my design at Eurovision Song, Song Contest couldn't include any single point of failure. So that's another extremely important concept when you're talking about redundancy. What is a single, single point of failure? Is a device or, let's say, um, Logically, uh, uh, let's say, uh, something that you can consider a whole, a unique thing, so usually is a device, which is having a power supply or maybe a redundant power supply, that's a good idea, right? But if that fails, well, then you lose a significant portion of your service. That is a unique point of failure. You cannot have a unique point of failure in the entire device of a project like the Eurovision Song Contest or the Olympic inauguration or something like that. So a unique point of failure is not acceptable. And then it's making a lot complicated the entire design. So let's have a look a few examples. In one hour, we cannot cover all the details. I just want to give you some bits and pieces, some ideas around, and then I better answer some of your questions rather than going too much into the details. Big problem in such an environment is, what about the clock distribution? Uh, good question. I have so many devices, so just a crazy man like me could offer the solution to the EBU to try to do everything synchronous. And I did everything synchronous, from the monitor to the uh, front of house to the broadcast. 
all the devices were set to 48 kilohertz. So you might think, well, that's easy. Everybody's on, on 48 kilohertz. So where's the problem? It's a piece of cake. The typical good old days, a clock distribution, everyone is getting the, the, the clock, and then everybody's synchronous, so we're happy, no problem at all. Well, that's the theory. <laughs> if, what if your clock distributor is failing? Well, that's a point of failure. Oh, you have another one. Yes, but you know, not all the devices will have a redundant input in the work clock. So what? You see? It's extremely complicated. So just a crazy guy like me could have offered the opportunity to try, and actually we did, did everything synchronous. I passed sample to sample without any sample rate conversion between the sender and the receiver, the MADI router, the, 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 the router of the audio network, or, or something like that. Everything was absolutely synchronous. Synchronous. We like synchronous. Why? Because it gives you the best audio quality and because it gives you the minimum amount of latency from origin to destination. So if I can stay synchronous, of course I will stay synchronous. But with that responsibility, I would have never took the responsibility to design a synchronous sy system unless in any digital audio exchange, I would have had a reaction within one sample Then, if a sample rate conversion would have been needed, the sample rate conversion would have come up automatically within one sample time. Fantastic. So I can get the best out of the two options. If I don't need a sample rate converter, the sample rate converter will stay in bypass. But whenever something goes wrong for any reason, I can consider all the digital equipment like a clock island with no problem, no side effects, because the signal is sample rate converted bidirectionally. Okay? How can you do that? Well, it's simple. You have to have devices which are offering that option. If you don't have devices which are offering that option, forget about that option. So the clock distribution, now I don't think that we have the time to go in the detail, but this clock distribution is the connection that I had to establish between broadcast van, broadcast music mix, control room or patch room, live section four uh, monitoring and front of house. If everything would have go in the right direction, we would have remained completely synchronous among all the equipment, and that was the case during the, during the, the show and during the rehearsal. But in any point, any kind of failure, a cable disconnected, a, a coaxial cable not crimped correctly, a power down of, uh, of a clock distribution, uh, a fiber interruption in the digital loop or something like that, would have created a partially asynchronous system. The synchronism would have been solved completely, just reacting within one sample with a sample rate conversion, bidirectional, back and forth, right? Usually, when you work in uh, daily events which do not have that much time for rehearsal, you start by design isolating the clock responsibility and the clock islands for many reasons. You might have different sample rates, but at that point, there's no point to, to be synchronous. Or you cannot convince the broadcast van to accept your clock. Forget about it. You know, it, it's probably more, more, much, much more easy to convince the responsible of the, of the OB van to, to have a date with his wife rather than changing the idea about the, <laughs> the, the clock. Forget about it. They will not give you the possibility to change their clock. It's impossible. Too dangerous, too complicated. So usually, in 99% of the occasions, the live bubble lives in his own clock domain, and the broadcast bubble lives in his own domain. And when they have to exchange signal, he's going through a sample rate conversion. Fine, fair enough, not a problem. But hey, this was something which was rehearsed for three months. So why not trying to do that correctly? And keeping the backup solution as a backup solution reacting within one sample. So that is one of the things. It would take a couple of hours just to go through the work clock distribution. So I don't think that that's a good idea. So let's try to get some example to let you understand what I mean when you, have to, when you need to have two of everything at least or maybe more and uh, thinking about. So what about the playback desk? 
63 playback channels plus the BLDS, buffer loop detection system is an artificial audio signal invented by Dyret a few years ago to tell the receiver device not only if the signal is there or not. I'm still alive, I'm still alive, I'm still alive, I'm still alive. That's enough. Enough to have a trigger between a main and backup. But it's not enough to understand if the playback system is into a loop condition. Have you ever experienced something like audio doing something like g -g 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 because there's a loop going on inside, inside of the buffer, inside of the DAW or something like that. Well, if you play at pilot tone, like a one kilohertz tone, right, with no interruption in the audio, and you are in a loop condition, you still have your kilohertz tone going, going on. And therefore, you think that everything is okay. Why should change towards the, the redundant thing? But you don't like the idea that you g -g 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 no. So if you come up with the BLDS, buffer loop detection system, is an artificial audio signal which is basically telling the receiver one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. You know why one, two, three? Because this is the usual audio environment. We all can count up to three. If we would have counted up to ten, we could have had a different job. You know that, right? The reason why we have one, two, three is because when you are in a loop condition, it's always, the, the buffer is always a power of two. So the relevant situation when you are receiving a loop condition would be either one, two, one, two, or two, three, two, three, or three, one, three, one. Mm. In a matter of one sample, every sample is one, two, three, one, two, Three. If you get one, two, one, you immediately understand that you are in a loop condition and therefore you swap over the redundant loop. This is the trick which allows you to have a reaction time of one sample within the playback system. If you don't have the BLDS, you will not react within one sample. If you understand that you are losing the pilot tone, it will take you a few microseconds, which is fine anyway, but slower. So why not using the best technology available if I can? Then who's receiving? So there was a MacBook, or actually it was not a MacBook Pro, that was an old, you know, there was a Mac, um, a Mac Studio I, or an iMac, I think, three iMacs, but doesn't matter. Dante Verto Sankard, Dante Verto Sankard, and a MADI interface in a third Pro Tools with an RME MADI interface. For the Eurovision Song Contest, I didn't want just to have a main and a backup. I wanted to have a Pro Tools, which I called Disaster Recovery. And Disaster Recovery is just because if you have lost Pro Tools main and Pro Tools backup, it's already a disaster. That's the reason why I call it Disaster Recovery. Not because I'm giving up with some of the channels. They are absolutely equal. And I used the good old-fashioned MADI feed as a main. I use one of the make, mm, iMac with Dante Verto Sankard as a backup, and I use the third one as a disaster recovery. How? Connecting the MADI to two different Prodigy MP, which I designed, so every father is proud of his son. Of course, I'm, I'm proud of my baby, which is the Prodigy MP. But no matter what, when I'm a designer, I don't care if I design the device or not. That device could give me all the features that I needed to come up with the redundant plan I needed. It's a coincidence that I've been the designer. Well, is that really a coincidence? No, if you grew up with the idea of the redundancy, the time that is your turn to design a device, you put all your experience in. And that's, very, that's the reason why the Prodigy MP is the device in the world probably having more redundant aspect than anything else, right? So, MADI using MADI of the first device, MADI of the second device. You should know you should remember what I told you before. The live section, monitor and front of house, and the broadcast were supposed to work on the same clock domain. But if anything should have happened in the control or in the patch room, and the, the two bubbles would have been divided, I would have an incredible big problem. Which clock should I follow now? 
So I designed two Prodigy MPs. One is called broadcast and the other one is called live, not because they are different. But in case they would have divided the clock domain, this one would have followed the broadcast, this one would have followed the, the live. So being the redundant of the redundant selection, this one would have followed the live clock and the other one. So since the MADI ports of the Prodigy MP can have an automatic fast sample rate converter, there's no difference between this port and this port as long as the clock domain is the same. But as soon as the clock domain should be divided, this one will automatically activate the sample rate converter. So I had three different Pro Tools, two different Prodigy MPs, and I could save the entire show just having one Pro Tools running and one of the P running. Both MP would have been able to provide feeds to both the live section and the broadcast section. Long story short. So here there's a bunch of incredible amount of redundant aspect. Here's technology, and then automatic redundancy switching, detecting the BLDS in real time, reacting within one sample, selecting the main Pro Tools, sorry, the main Pro Tools, the backup, backup Pro Tools, or the disaster recovery Pro Tools, and this is true and is happening in parallel among the two different, you know, uh, things. The fact that I could have lost any clock connection would have been a disaster unless Dante is always having one device deciding the clock. Worst case scenario, Dante is divided by the clock. The sample rate conversion would have happened automatically in every detection here. So even Pro Tools and the Prodigy would have been solving the problem automatically even if the clock would have been even more further you know, fragmented among the several pieces. So the two MADI output were distributing to two, four, sorry, different metrics, MADI metrics, which were four because two of them were providing the feeds of the, to the, towards the live environment, monitor console in front of us console through a couple of digital loops, and two independent MADI router distributed the feed to the, towards the broadcaster. Why two here and why two there? Because you need to have two of everything. And then you need to have an automatic redistribution of everything. So this is just a playback portion of the redundant solution. On top of that, and this is something that I would have not designed because there's a limit to everything, but the big boss of Rite Television told me later on, Luca, I couldn't sleep tonight. Why? Because I'm thinking about my ass, oh, sorry, I'm thinking about my responsibility today, and then I'm, 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 a, I'm a, an old-fashioned guy. I like the idea to put together a fully analog disaster recovery, uh, you know, track, just in case everything goes completely wrong. and say, hey, I mean, okay, not a problem. So, analog output of the 32 tracks from this guy here feeding a stage rack completely, split it analog, feeding a disaster recovery ob -Van with an analog console in, right? I don't think that even the, the sound engineer didn't show up a single day because you know, it was really, really, really behind any logical thing, but nevertheless. So this is just the idea of the thing. So how can you come up with a, a virtual scenario where you can simulate what's going on? It's very simple. Use a software. I use Omnigraffle, but you can use whatever you want, which is linking the arrow with the device or something. So if you want to simulate what is happening if you lose this, just cancel this. All of a sudden, all the lines connected to that will go away, and you see what is remaining and see if it's working or not, or what you have to put in place in order to reorganize the thing. So when I design something like that, I do all the Ks and I simply decide to analyze what if Pro Tools main fails. You see that the Pro Tools main is not any longer there? Completely disappeared. Who cares? This is already a, still a redundant system. So we, what is the residual level of redundancy after the first failure? You still have a level two, because you still have two options to save your Show. <laughs> so, no problem here. You have to have two 
switches in primary, both primary and secondary in trunking, because if you don't do that, then you have a point of failure, which is the switch itself. Not a good idea, right? So both switches are doing primary and secondary, not because you need secondary from the Pro Tools, because Dante Virtual Sound Card doesn't have it, but because what you are distributing among this one and this one is fed by the result of the Dante options inside of the Prodigy, which has primary and secondary. So you cannot have one switch doing primary and one switch doing secondary, because that would become a unique point of failure, right? So what if, after having lost the main Pro Tools, you also uh, uh, lose the backup Pro Tools? you still have your, redundant, your disaster recovery feeding Dante through, 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 throughout this, the trunking. Both of the Prodigy MP are still working and both of the, uh, the four metrics. So nobody is even paying attention. And during the rehearsal, which took one month or something like that, I instructed the playback guys, A, force the failure every day randomly. Don't worry, we need to test the system. We need to know exactly what is going on. We need to double check if the, the LTC is having some hiccups or something like that. And they were very scared at the beginning you know, to do that. Do it! And I was forcing the loss of, the loss of work lock. I was randomly switching off devices up there and there and there. That's the best way to test it. Don't wait the day of the show to test your redundant system. It's a very bad idea. Right? And then if you do that, there's also a psychological uh, thing. When you train your crew and you, they know that you have a redundant plan in, pl in place, they are much more relaxed and focused on what they have to do. They are not thinking about, oh, they are not scared. And then the best is that if something really bad happens during the show, they don't lose, they don't freak out because they know that we have a redundant plan which is absolutely safe because they went through that already. So while you are testing your redundant plan, you are also training the people to you know, address the panic. Like when you do the, you know, um, this is not you know, when you have the alarming of the fire. Oh, okay, don't care, oh, no, now, all of a sudden, you know, the fire alarming is starting. So we ask ourselves, okay, is that a real problem or it's just a, you know, a test or a training or something like that? Well, this is not a training. This, the, 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 the building is on fire. You know, get out of here, right? So when testing your redundant plan, you are also training the mind of the operators. All the operators are ready to understand what is the implication for their little amount of job, if they have their portion of the responsibility cover, if what is supposed to work really worked or not, and stuff like that. So train and test your redundant system. I do that virtually when I design things, and then I do that for real when I'm on site. So I already had two different failures, Pro Tools main, Pro Tools backup. But it's very unfortunate, it's not my day, so I'm losing also, on top of the other problem, also a Prodigy MP, the one supposed to feed the broadcast guys. Not a problem. This fast SRC will get in because it's detecting that is now different to the feed that is getting here. So it's applying sample rate converter. So this one is following the, uh, the live clock and those metrics are clocked on the live clock anyway. And this is absolutely feeding the other thing. In this case, I don't have feed for this one, but I have the feed on the other one. But A, I already had three different problems at the same time. So it's not just the first level of redundancy. We are talking about three different, not correlated problems happening at the same time. I already switched off on purpose three main devices and I'm still alive. Now, I can switch off this one again, or this one again, then I will start to have real, real problems. But hey, I'm already at level five. If you have more than five devices which are not having any, anything to do with each other, failing at the same time, you better book a ticket to Lourdes, which is the place in France where a miracle happens. But be careful. Check if they are open because it's not your day. So you might get there and then, and then you find it closed, right? So let's have a look quickly to 
another portion, which is the monitor thing, which is kind of understandable and kind of easy. Digital loop, where's the monitor rig? Oh, let me have a look. The monitor rig should be here. Patch room, you need a monitor feed. Okay, this is kind of a fairly simple situation. So you should know that we had two different uh, digital loops, two stage rack, because we needed more than 56 channel among the uh, microphone preamplifier uh, receiver of the RF microphone. So two stage rack of 56 channel each on the same digital loop, one monitor console, one, uh, let's say they call it rehearsal console, which was just behind the stage, checking the uh, uh, RF uh, situation of the artist, which was next. So they couldn't stop the show, so the monitor console was involved with the band really on stage, but the next one was already rehearsing all the things. So there was a monitor console, a small digital console, on purpose just to make the line check of the RF in-ear monitors and RF microphone, a few minutes before getting on the stage. So they were part of the same digital loop. We will look at that later on, but just focus on the monitor console. We had the monitor console A and the monitor console B running in mirror. So whatever real-time movement happening in one console would have been absolutely replicated in the second console. The operator could run on the first surface and the second surface, so the surface itself was redundant, right? Because it's absolutely in line with the other one. So every monitor console, they didn't communicate back to their stage rack, but straight MADI output to two different Prodigy MPs. Again, in-ear monitor main, in-ear monitor backup. So the first MADI coaxial with the 64 channels, so 32 stereo pairs, actually were 30 stereo pairs plus a tone, which was giving me the impression, or the impression, the indication that the console was still alive, with a, with a pilot tone constantly produced by the stage rack, not even the console, but it's a long story. And the second one, in the other way around, the Prodigy could have been picked up the first or the second console with the MADI redundancy within one sample time, no problem at all. So the Prodigy could get the feed from console A or console B, the same for the, second, the, first, the second one, could get the feed from the first for the second one. The problem is that the in-ear monitor, uh, in monitor transmitters, the ones which were available at the time, but I think that there are no still available on the market, in-ear monitor transmitter with a digital input. They wanted to have a, an analog feed. So if the Prodigy could not be the point of failure, I needed to collect the 32 analog plus 32 analog, 64 analog signal from rig number A and rig number B and get a radial switcher to decide if the analog portion was the first one or the second one. And then the radial switcher was getting to this. Is this a, a point of failure? Yes, but it's analog. There's no electronic behind. And then if something goes wrong at the switcher is happening with the GPIO drive driven by this, if this is disappearing, the GPIO would, should go down and this is normally connected to the first one. So this one, if it's failing, is just a, a, a through between input and output. So actually it cannot fail, it's mechanical. If this would have been a digital switch, it would have been not acceptable in my design because that would have been representing a unique point of failure. But since it's mechanical, worst case scenario, no power on the radial switcher, the relay is normally closed and therefore the A would go through. As simple as that. So it's not like not being there. Worst case scenario is not there, right? So this is the way that we can feed. We could feed the in-ear monitor. So guess what? You lose one console, not a problem. Both the Prodigy will get immediately the feed from the second console. You lose one Prodigy, the second Prodigy is getting the console, the two consoles. You lose one of the other things, you always have the possibility to reach the 32 stereo transmitters for the in-ears monitors. This little trick. 
how the switcher can understand if the signal is valid or not. It's analog. It's very difficult. But it's much better to have the logic happening inside of a clever device, which can be programmed with automator. And it says, if you don't have signals from both this MADI and this MADI, there's nothing that you can fit out. So trigger the GPO and let the other have a chance. Done. If that, that would have suddenly that because of power supply failure, same effect. GPO goes down, and then automatically the system is getting the second one. I didn't have to do anything but testing it before. Another example, well, the patch room is kind of complicated, so I don't think we have the time to go through the patch room. Digital loop, quite understandable. Okay, so loop one, stage rack number one, stage rack number two. The DD2 is an optical device which is exchanging MADI and digital loop where I could extract MADI from the digital loop and get to the two MADI routers. Monitor console of loop one, RF check, the console I told you before, loop one, front of house console loop one, mirrored situation in a different digital loop. I originally wanted to design one big digital loop because at that point every console could have picked up signal from every, every uh, stage rack. But then I had a long discussion with the rental company expert Agora, which is an Italian company, which in the last 10 years, they did very important jobs all over the world. They're a friend of mine. They are Italian. We know each other since ever. And Domenico told me, Luca, you sure that you really want to come up with just a unique, uh, unique uh, um, loop of Digico? Because I know why you want to do that. But we have experienced that if something goes wrong in one of the fiber connection in any point, you will have hiccup in the entire Digico ring. And therefore, there's no help from the other console. So while if you divide the two loops, at least if you have a problem in one loop, the other loop is absolutely you know, out of that problem, and then you can switch over. It was a hard decision, but in the end, I took that decision. But that cost me extra design and extra devices. Why? Because if you divide the two loop, then you cannot say, oh, no problem. If I lose the front of house console number one, then the second console can pick up the signal from the stage, stage rack number one. No, because they are not part of the same digital loop. So it's really having the digital world like a whole. So the entire digital loop becomes a unique point of failure. There you go. You cannot accept that. So I need to have the possibility that if this console is having a problem, and if that stage rack is having a problem, not a problem because that stage red rack should be able to feed this console as well. So I have all the independency. So if I have the possibility to feed with that stage rack both this console and this console, then I can consider this one not any longer as a unique point of failure, but I can divide the point of failure of every single element. So in order to do that, I had to collect the MADI output of each stage, go to a, a purple box, connect the other uh, uh, you know, console as a redundant MADI input. So if uh, the console couldn't get the feed from the normal digital loop, I would have had the possibility to feed it with a purple box with that, with the complication that that forces me to keep the two digital loop under the same clock. Otherwise, I wouldn't have the possibility to do that because the purple box is not doing sample reconversion and the console doesn't have, doesn't have sample reconversion. So I needed to make sure that the two digital loop no matter what, would have stayed on the same clock. Not easy because optocore is in the middle, right? So you need to feed a clock to the optocore loop, and you have to make sure that the two optocore loops, which are by definition independent because they are two different fiber loops, stays on the same clock reference. So you see, there's a lot of complicated things. So this is the schematic of the console. So the consoles could grab if everything went in the normal situation, each console had the possibility to grab the information from each own uh, stage racks, but also from the other one. Time is flying fast. Just want to show you something regard regarding the front of house distribution. In the front of house, we had a kind of a complicated situation where you had 32 clusters of L-acoustic systems all over the uh, arena. Same story. Front of house SD7 main console, front of house backup. 
two MADI each Prodigy MP main and MP mirror in dual redundant mode. Same uh, settings for DSP alignment, speakers, and whatever. Analog disaster recovery to radial switchers. If everything went wrong, the optocore rig used to, to have the distribution or something would have failed. We had a disaster recovery plan with all the 32 analog feeds for the 32 cluster distributed and with the, the help of the software of L Acoustic would have informed in one click to all the amplifiers to get, not, not to get any longer the AES3 information, but to revert to the analog. That was the disaster recovery. We already had other two levels of redundancy. Two optocore MADI devices were spilling the information in a cross manner from the two Prodigy MP in front of us. Those two devices were injecting audio signals into the nodes of the AES uh, distribution of optocore with a dual redundant uh, loop fiber or something. And those optocore were triggered by a watchdog MP switcher detecting the fact that those optocore devices were still alive. If one of the two would have died, the detection of the sudden death of the optocore would have triggered something inside of the automator we should have sent a MIDI command straight to the software of OptiCore, change the patch, and reestablish the connection of the front of house thing. So in this case, a device which can be programmed with triggers and actions was used to overcome a missing feature of another system. As a designer, you need to know, it's over, I know, um, you need to know which are the possibilities of the devices that you can play with or you have to play with, and you have to find a solution inside or outside the device. You have to look at the project as a whole, not as individual. Time is running fast. As you can see, we can keep going on forever. So I'd rather have the last five minutes for a question from the audience, if any. Otherwise, I invite you to come over today or tomorrow. I will be at ProLid uh, stand beside my devices. So if you want to deepen some of the aspects, Welcome, come, come over, and we have a discussion. Sorry? Did any equipment actually fail? No, we, we made them fail on purpose during the rehearsal because we knew that we could off go offline uh, loading uh, sessions uh, coming from the rehearsal r r r without interrupting the the exhibition because we knew that we can count on the other one. So actually all the redundance aspect uh, helped not interrupting the shows or during the rehearsal because we knew we could do that. So it was everything was absolutely flawless. We didn't have to interrupt the, the shows if we had to take care about some aspects, uh, uh, programming the console or something like that. But during the three uh, registered you know, events or the live shows, not a single failure. So I was completely useless in the end. But they pay me anyway, so. OK? Thank you for coming. Thank you for your attention. I wish you a great day. And I'll see you next time in here in Norway. Thank you.